All right, welcome everybody. Glad to see you here and happy Oceans Day. All right, let's give the oceans a big <laughs> round of applause. My name is Andrew Day. I am the Vice President of OceanWise. And if you didn't hear the news, today the Vancouver Aquarium launched a new global initiative called OceanWise. Vancouver Aquarium will stay the Vancouver Aquarium as the fantastic visitor facility that it is. But in light of and in honor of the ocean and the issues and challenges that it faces, we've decided to uh, expand our reach even further and become an international conservation organization. And part of the reason we're doing that is because the oceans face pretty grave challenges. And one of those challenges, which we'll talk about tonight, is climate change. Most of you think of trees as the lungs of the earth, but in fact, most, every second breath we breathe comes from the ocean, tiny life in the ocean. And the ocean is not only uh, life-giving for us with our breath, but it provides us with food and all kinds of other wonderful amenities that keep us and all the other life on the planet alive. So, without further ado, we are very happy to, uh, to present this session and we're very grateful to our partners in this session. We've had the City of Vancouver, of course the, the Vancouver Aquarium, the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, or PICS, the Adaptation to Climate Change team at SFU, and the Pacific Water Research Center in the Faculty of Environment at SFU. I would like to introduce now Deborah Harford, who is with the, who's the Executive Director of the Adaptation to Climate Change team at SFU, a Climate Solutions Fellow at SFU Center for Dialogue, and an Adjunct prof Professor at the School for Resource Environmental Management at SFU. Deborah will introduce the speakers and the series. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming. We're really excited because this is the kickoff of a series of talks we're going to be doing on this extremely important global issue, sea level rise, that will have implications for British Columbia, but also for people around the world. And I'll say a little bit more about some of the other events that we'll be hosting this fall in that series with the same partners that Andrew has just introduced to you. Um, so for now, I'd like to introduce my colleagues, um, all highly respected people in their fields, and it's a real uh, honor and privilege to have them with us tonight to present diverse and very practical points of view on this issue for uh, our local region. So first I'd like to introduce John Reedshaw. John is the manager of coastal engineering at SNC Lavalin. And John is the lead designer and project manager for a number of projects in British Columbia that consider cost-effective and sustainable solutions for adapting to the issues that sea level rise will pose for all of us. Angela Daniluk is a sustainability specialist at the city of Vancouver. And Angela works across disciplines on projects and programs related to adaptation to sea level rise, as well as ecology and biodiversity. And last but not least, Andy Yan is the director of the city program at Simon Fraser University. And Andy is a former senior urban planner at Bing Tom Architects, uh, amongst many other uh, roles, and did some very interesting work on sea level rise and what it may mean for our region. So without further ado, I'd like to hand back over to Andrew as our moderator for the evening and invite John up to begin the talks. Uh, thank you, Deborah and, uh, and Andrew, and um, thank you all for coming. I'm amazed to see that you've come to talk on sea level rise and there's not a single person in the auditorium wearing a life jacket. <laughs> but um, anyway. So I'm, what I'm going to try to go over here uh, fairly quickly, uh, we don't want to keep you here all night, and, and some of you know that I can talk, um, is a bit of background on the processes leading to sea level rise, um, th some of the global sea level rise scenarios, what that means or how that translates to here in BC, and then a very brief summary of, of what does all this mean, and that's more of a segue really for my, my co-presenters here. Um, 
Angela and uh, Andy. So I think everybody here is familiar with the, uh, um, the process that's going on. We've got uh, large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions going up into the atmosphere. We're currently at about just slightly over 400 parts per million of CO2, CO2 equivalents in the atmosphere. And that is considerably above the highest historical values that uh, over the last, for instance, 400,000 years, which is what this graph is showing. Those squiggles there in the brown at the bottom are, uh, go back over several ice ages. Um, so we are way above what the planet has seen already. Uh, in fact, I think uh, if we go back about 65 million years ago is about when we saw 400 parts per million uh, before, and it was a much different planet at the time. Uh, temperatures in the air and over the land and, and over the ice are, are creeping up. Uh, the red line there is sort of a smoothed curve through the air temperature, uh, land temperatures. Uh, and we're pushing now about 1.2 degrees C of warming, uh, getting close to the 1.5 and, and approaching the two that everybody talks about as being the goals that we should achieve. Uh, the blue line is the uh, sea surface temperatures, and that's uh, a little bit less, about 0 .6, to 0 0.6 degrees C. And of course, that's enough to actually cause uh, some sea level rise because the ocean expands as it, as it warms. But temperature alone is not really the issue. Um, it's uh, what's really important is the heat content in the atmosphere, heat content in the land and the ice, but even more importantly, the heat content in the ocean. And, and those two blue curves there show how much of the solar imbalance, which is being captured by the greenhouse uh, gas emissions, is being captured in the ocean. Um, the light blue is the, you might call a shallow ocean down to 700 meters. The, the darker blue is the deeper ocean down to 2,000. So the, the energy that's building up in the ocean is, is, is increasing substantially. And the, and the, uh, but the heat energy that's just in the land is, is much less. It's a much smaller portion. It's only about 3% of the energy imbalance. So the ocean temperatures are very, very important. What's been happening in, uh, in terms of the average sea level around the planet uh, since about the 1900s, beginning of the industrial era, so to speak, has been slowly increasing. It's been doubling from originally about 0.6 millimeters per year to 1.4 in the, in the mid-60s, for instance. And then uh, and that's the blue curves, which is a compilation from all of the tide gauges all over the world. And the red curve, the red dots are the results of the more recent satellite measurement programs, uh, starting in about 1993, several satellite missions. And um, they're showing, of course, uh, another doubling to about 3.3 millimeters per year. So that's not very much for now. If we zoom in and look at the satellite data, then you, this, is, this is looking at, at that satellite data, and you can see that it's not a smooth curve, it's not a, it's not a straight line, it goes up and down in 1998. Uh, for instance, you can see there was a bit of a jump in sea levels. That was, a, for those, some of you may remember, we had a fairly strong, what's called an El Nino event, a lot of warming, a lot of storms. Uh, and then in 2011, there was a bit of a dip, um, about uh, 10, 10 millimeters in the average sea level rise. That's actually been attributed and understood now to be related to the take up of a lot of moisture, a lot of rainfall. Um, from uh, in Australia, which had just suffered through a, a large drought. So there's several papers on that. And then starting around about there, you can see what starts to look like a little bit of an increase in sea level rise. It goes up and down, uh, and that's, up to, that's updated now to the end of 2016. Um, and if you do what engineers love to do, which is draw straight lines through squiggly lines, um, you can see that that's actually about six millimeters per year. Um, perhaps starting back in about 2011. Um, so that's actually a doubling of the last 20 years of sea level rise. And I'm going to come back to this doubling point uh, in this talk and hope to um, illustrate what, why that's important. Of course, that's an average of all of the sea level measurements from the satellites uh, all over the world. And this is a graph or a plot uh, from NASA 2014, which shows the relative uh, the rise in sea level around the planet uh, between 1992 when the satellite programs first started and in 2014 which is when this plot was pre presented you can see the red colors are areas where there's been about 70 millimeters of rise sea level rise since 1992 the blue there's actually been uh, a loss of sea level rise and if you you go up to the upper corner oops i always do that uh, well if you go up to the your upper 
uh, right-hand corner, you, you, you end up in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, if you look closely, it sort of suggests that there hasn't been much sea level rise. We're, we're starting to, we've been looking at that, people have been looking at it, and, and it's starting to be appreciated that there is some effect from the coast mountain ranges on some of the satellite return signals from the radar altimetry. Oregon has looked at that in great detail, and, and they've revised their numbers. There's a paper just published um, last year, the end of 2016, where they've looked at this in a lot more detail as well, and they looked at the, the actual satellite measurements in those three boxes. And, and if we talk about the Pacific Northwest box, that, that red box there that I've highlighted, then you can first of all see that uh, from the yellow and greens that that's actually a little bit more, that it's not zero. Um, that's what they're seeing in there. But what's even more interesting was they, they took that data and did a lot of mathematics, and we don't have time to go into it tonight. Um, you can find the paper. Uh, I think it's open source. Uh, and the red line there is the total, uh, the average over that box, the Pacific Northwest box, of the total sea level uh, measured by the satellites. And then the results of the analysis produce these two lines. The, the blue line, which is just, they were able to capture and separate out what they could attribute to El Nino, La Nina effects in the subtropics. And then the black line accounts for a large balance of that rise that's being measured. And it's simply in that paper called, it's a longer term oscillation. It's much longer than El Nino and La Nina that you continually hear about. It's sort of got a five to eight year period oscillation. And um, it's probably related, and I'm, I'm projecting a little bit here, to the turnover uh, of the ocean, uh, the deep ocean uh, warmer water going from warm to cool um, in, in the North Atlantic, or in the North Pacific, sorry. And if I think some of you may remember from 2015, a lot of talk about a warm blob, about 500 nautical miles off the coast. And uh, if you go, actually, I, I had that plot, but I would have taken too much of my co-speaker's time to include that. If you go in there and look at the same data presentation today, uh, for, for, for yesterday, because there's a 24 hour lag, uh, there's now a cold spot out there. And in fact, the total temperature difference in the, and this is near surface, so it's not just the surface current, it's about, I think, 200 meters deep, um, is a, a total change in temperature of about 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, so I suspect if we could go back, and that needs to be done now, look, we sort of see this process and look through the, the longer, older data sets, we'll start to understand that a lot more. But um, what's interesting is it, it does sort of give the, some support to a sense that a lot of folks have that in British Columbia we weren't seeing sea level rise. That's that you could average that trend out from say 1992 to maybe 2012. It, you know, it averages out at sort of zero, but it's definitely turned up uh, in, in the last four or five years. Whoops. And uh, if you again do the engineering thing and put a straight line through that curve, that's actually 33 millimeters per year. So it's suggesting in the last four or five years, we're actually starting to see, you know, a little bit more than an inch of sea level rise. That's very difficult to go out and observe on the beach. I mean, you would have to go out on a high spring tide day, you know, in the winter or even in the summer, we get these high spring tides every two weeks and have made a mark on a rock or something and, you know, and done that for successive years and you might see that creeping up. But that's what the data is telling us. Um, so what does this mean? And, and how does this fit into what we're thinking about here in the lower mainland in British Columbia in general? This is a curve that um, was published in 2011 by the province. It's the sea level rise planning guidance curve. Uh, I admit to being responsible for a lot of that, not solely, but largely. And we looked at the data that was available um, at what was called the IPCC um, Assessment Report 4, which was published in 2007, and that's kind of, I've got that located just here on the edge, it's that gray band. That was all of the information, those were the ranges of projections. And we grappled with that and with some data that was available after 2007 and thought, well, the best thing to do here is to make a straight line projection, get people thinking, talking about it, keep it simple, and we were suggesting it would be, we should start thinking about half a meter by 2050. It's a little bit conservative. We should think about a meter by 2100. It's kind of in the middle. And then because sea level is going to keep rising, we knew that, we know that, um, we'd put in two meters for 2200, simply because that made that a nice straight line. And it was something to start talking and thinking about. 
So what I want to talk about now is what's happened since then. In 2011, uh, post-2011. So in 2014, the IPCC released another assessment report. The science in that was from 2013. And I guess the three big take-home points I would suggest is that, first of all, it was unequivocal. There is going to be sea level rise. It's going to be sustained. And it's going to be of these sort of magnitudes that we're talking about. Uh, it was acknowledged in their documents, if you read through them carefully, that it's, a, it's probably a low estimate for any of the scenarios I looked at, because it is a consensus. There's a 185 countries, or 197, I forget how many were participated in that exactly. But it, they all agree, all the scientists from every country and all of the political minders from every country. And I won't say anything more about that. Um, and that the business as usual scenarios, so how much carbon dioxide would, would we be putting out into the atmosphere, what population growths would be, um, those ranges out of those different scenarios were all higher than in AR4. And that, if we turn, translate it into what did that mean for sea level rise, is basically the green curve there, which we call AR5, RCP 8.5, which is the uh, business as usual scenario. Um, in, in all of the scenarios I looked at. And you know, that had, had definitely moved up, upwards, uh, from 2007. Um, and that included a, a consideration of the ice melting in Greenland, which we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, if you looked in very carefully into the science report, which is about 1,200 pages long, and about page 900, there's a little discussion about the West Antarctic ice sheets. And if you, they only show uh, or suggest a number for 2,100, which is at little gray, dark gray star there, um, which was about 1.4 meters by 2100. And if you take the curve that they had already suggested would be more increasing faster and draw that through that, then you end up with that gray curve. So not much difference in the early years, but, but uh, substantially more by 2200 for sure. So what else has happened since uh, 2011 is a much greater understanding of the melting of the big ice sheets in Greenland in, in, in the Antarctica continent. And in, in May of 2014, as a result of um, several satellite programs, the GRACE program, the cry European Cryosat Satellite Program, uh, it was realized that um, some of the, most of the Greenland ice sheets that discharge ice into the uh, ocean, into the Atlantic Ocean, um, were no longer grounded, which means that the ice was not sitting on bedrock. It's what was thought originally. And so the ocean was getting in underneath. And uh, you remember what I told you about the heat content in the ocean, it's getting warmer. And they basically said that this melting in Greenland is unstoppable as a result of the ice getting in underneath, uh, the, the ocean getting in underneath the ocean. There's seven meters of sea level rise potential in those Greenland ice sheets. In December, Similar analysis of the West Antarctica ice sheets suggested that they also were no longer uh, grounded. One of the scientists um, is famously quoted as saying that the fuse is blown, uh, and that melting is unstoppable, and that has a potential for six meters. That's not going to happen overnight. We're talking over um, long periods of time. 2016, 2017, there was another paper because this, these, uh, these programs had been expanded as a result of what was being learned. And it was realized that some of the East Antarctic ice sheets are no longer grounded. Now, some is a key word there, because not all of it. If all of Antarctica continent melted, um, then sea levels would rise something like 60 meters. Um, but these are only some of the big ice sheets, uh, ice fields, if you like, in Antarctica. But nevertheless, they suggested there's about 13 meters of, of sea level rise potential there. And, and this is just a graphic sort of suggesting, how, showing how that works. We've got the, the ice sheet over there on, on your uh, left, and then an ice shelf out in front, which is essentially floating on, on the ocean. Uh, and you've got the continental shelf, the bedrock, if you like. We used to think that it was the ice sheets were perched out there at the continental shelf. That's no longer the case. That's what the, the ice penetrating radar has shown and that the warmer ocean waters are coming up the, the slope of the continental shelf, getting in under the ice, and the ice is melting. And um, you know, this is what's also going on, of course, is some of the big ice shelves, the floating sections, are also starting to break up. And you may have heard about the Larsen Sea ice shelf. Um, it uh, was realized in November 2016 uh, that a large, long crack, it's several hundred kilometers long, had formed on the outer edge of the ice shelf. That's a, an image there at the bottom, or, um, down here, of showing the, the ice shelf and where the, the crack has been forming. And I think last week they said there's only eight, I believe it's eight kilometers left before that, 
that iceberg, which is going to be about twice the size of Vancouver Island, breaks off. That's not going to result in sea level rise because it's already floating. Um, but what, that, what happened when some of the other ice shelves broke up catastrophically like that is that that uh, progressed backwards through the, ice, the floating ice shelf and it released um, sort of buttressing arch effect on the ice sheet, the, the grounded ice sheets behind that, and they started to accelerate. So again, um, more information, more trends, all suggesting that, that ice is going to come faster and sea levels are probably going to rise faster. Just in terms of the melting of these large ice sheets, this is a little bit out of date now. It's showing uh, it's up to 2009. I haven't found an update that's as well illustrated as this one, but it's, it's showing how much of the ice mass in these ice sheets has been melting. And, and basically, both Greenland and Antarctica started to have net melting in about 2006. And by 2009, you can see that there was 800 gigatons from the measurements, satellite measurements, had, had melted. Now, I don't know how many of you know, but a gigaton of ice is one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer of ice. It's, it's a big ice cube. And, um, you need 36,000 of those two, those ice cubes to melt to get a meter of sea level rise. Well, if you take, if you do the math on, on Greenland and Antarctica and you include some of the other areas, um, that suggests that in 2009, in three years, we were 4% of the way towards one meter of sea level rise. And if you then again do the engineering thing, which is to put a straight line to that, never just leaving aside, will it accelerate because of things like ice, um, Larsen C, then that suggests we might see a meter of sea level rise by 2060. So the other big change uh, from 2011 is what I put down under the label of, of paleoclimatology, an understanding really, and by that I mean an understanding of what happened the last time there was 400 parts per million of, of um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And, um, and we, had, we were starting to approach one or two degrees of C. And there's a lot of work done looking back at the oxygen isotopes that are trapped in ice, and they, they give us a lot of that information. And um, the seminal paper was released by Dr. James Hansen, um, former director of the NASA Space Goddard Center, a well-known speaker on this topic and, and probably the one of the first people to really warn us that this was happening. And about 17 other scientists, many of them involved in these ice monitoring programs, uh, re released this paper in 2016, and you can, it went online. It was publicly reviewed for uh, a year. You can find it. You go into Google and Hansen et al. 2016, you'll find it. If you went through high school science, it's, you can read it. You can understand it. Um, it took me a couple of weeks to really understand it, but uh, to boil it down, they said that the last time, as I said, we, we had this sort of process going on, we saw four meter, five meters of sea level rise in a century. And um, they did a lot of modeling, climate models, looking at the information that they were, were um, talking about and making some changes and uh, basically boiled it down to suggesting that what we should start to see is a doubling of sea level rise every 10 years. So we go from three millimeters over the last 20 years to maybe six over the next five. If we, in the next five or 10 years, we start seeing 12, um, then that fits with this 10 year doubling model um, that Hansen uh, and, and, and the others have, have put forward. And if you take that relationship, and it's fairly simple mathematics to work it out, um, you get that red curve which the Hansen et al. curve, and I, I call these folks the paleoclimate pessimists. Um, I, I'm actually standing here quite prepared to say I, I don't really think they're pessimists. They may be the most practically prudent folks out there, um, but that's a significant change. Uh, briefly, I'm just gonna chat a, talk a little bit about summer ice coverage, because that's going on now. We're into approaching summer. In, uh, and since 2011, the AR5 report suggested that the Arctic would be summer ice free by 2085. Um, the measured data is suggesting it's gonna, be, it's gonna be maybe sometime in the 2010, 2020s. The US Navy in 2014 released a report where they looked at the volume of ice and suggested that it would be, um, the, summer, the Arctic would be summer ice free by 2016, plus or minus three years. And um, if you look at the coverage, this is, 
the seasonal ice coverage through the year. 2012 was the lowest on, on record. We got very close to about 3 million square kilometers and about 1 to 2 is considered to be basically ice free. Um, and in 2017, you can see the up at the top there, that's where we are uh, yesterday. Um, we're lower than we were in 2012, so uh, we'll see what happens in this, in, in this summer. The Navy might be right. And that's kind of important if you take that data trend and look back to what are all the climate models telling us. And that's the gray curves. It's all the different models, a lot of different models. We're all suggesting ice, summer, the Arctic being summer ice free in 2100. And there's in the red line is the actual measured data. Um, quite a bit faster. Uh, if you just look at where do the models tell us we should be in the ice cover should be in the end of the summer as it was measured in 2012, well, the models were saying 2060, so things are definitely going faster. And uh, if you again do that projection down, then it looks like 2020 might be uh, a likely date. Again, pretty consistent with the US Navy from all of the observations that they had of the thickness of the ice from their submarines were suggesting. So where does that leave us today? To start talking about adaptation, as my co-presenters are gonna get into a lot more, is we have these kind of two curves. One pretty straight line, um, and the paleoclimate pessimists, uh, a much more steeper curve. And, and what's the basis behind it? What's the underlying sort of fun fundamentals? It's really the difference between the melting of ice in air, which is basically what AR4 in 2007 captured, and the melting of ice in water, um, which is what uh, obviously seem is going on now. And, and you can do this experiment yourself at home. You can convince yourself of the, at least the logic, not the rate. Just take a saucer and a glass of water, room temperature, and take two ice cubes. Put one ice cube on the saucer and one ice cube in the glass. And I can guarantee, I've done this many times now, that ice cube in the glass will be gone in 10 to 15 minutes. But in three hours later, the ice cube on the saucer will still be an ice cube. Um, that's what we're talking about. It's that heat capacity in the ocean uh, relative to the heat capacity in the air that's really driving this whole process. So um, we don't know which one's right. I've suggested which one I think is probably closer to being right. But definitely everything is telling us that sea level is going to go higher. If we're talking about half a meter, it doesn't really matter which curve we're talking about. Um, they're both about the same, you can see there. We start talking about 2100, then we've got, uh, there's no doubt that we've got a meter of sea level rise coming. The real question is when? Is it gonna be 2060 or is it gonna be 2100? And so with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-presenters. Um, you know, the question is, how do we adapt? And I put up my little graphic here of King Canute because he's falsely accused of um, taking his throne down uh, to the to the beach and commanding the tide to this this the oceans to stop rising. That's actually not true. If you look it up, he was very wise. He was very knowledgeable. He took had his cr his throne taken down to the beach. He sat it on the edge and he demonstrated to his administrators, who are standing behind him in this engraving, that even the king cannot stop the sea level rising. So, I leave you with that thought. Um, this is a little bit of a summary. I think I've gone a little bit over. Uh, I want to just say that, you know, for, for um, we don't have to worry too much about who's right right now. For the next 25 years, you know, the typical time you live in a property, if you happen to be fortunate enough to own coastal property, you know, it's going to be a half meter. That's about the same as typical mortgages. You know, if you just bought that place, you're going to have a 25-year mortgage. But if we're starting to think about longer-term things, like major coastal infrastructure, big dikes, how are we going to protect ourselves? How are we going to protect the the various parts, then those are the long-term options. And the big questions there are, how long do we want them to stay in place? How long do we expect them to last? Uh, if we're talking about land redevelopment, lots of that going on, how much more challenging are we going to make adaptation if we continue to do that close to the ocean's edge? And if we bring it back again to ourselves, if it's just the resale of the property at the end of that 25-year life, I suspect, like most of us here, if you own that, that's your nest egg. And the question that you've got to ask yourself is, who will you sell it to? Um, and that's it <laughs> for now. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Great. I think yours. That's you. I have one job. Thank you. All right. Woo. All right. Thanks. Thanks, John, for that. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Angela Daniluk. I am a biologist with the Sustainability Group at the City of Vancouver, and it's really nice to be here on World Oceans Day, so thank you. I always learn um, something new or something that I might have forgotten and pushed to the side when I hear John talk, so noted, noted, John. Um, this picture of a jellyfish was actually taken at the aquarium, and I just wanted to pause um, and, and give a little factoid about it. It's my nod to another um, marine climate change impact, ocean acidification. So as we're emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, some of those emissions, carbon dioxide, are actually getting absorbed by the ocean. So not only are our oceans getting hotter, but they're getting more acidic. And that's a problem for my friends with spines or with shells, um, like lobster and clams and, um, and sea urchins. They won't be able to form those shells. And so what you'll get is an ocean full of jellyfish. And I mean, I like jellyfish, but I really am a big fan of the shelled ones too. And we have actually already experienced it, or experienced um, ocean acidification events in the Salish Sea and on this coast. So it's something to think about um, as you're perusing the aquarium or you're enjoying a, a lobster the next time. But I'm not here to talk about ocean acidification. I'm here to talk about sea level rise and what the city is doing. And before I start that, I wanted to uh, explain to you what my connection to the coast is. So here I am with my sister back in the day, somewhere far, far in the 1990s. Um, I grew up on this coast on the Salish Sea boating with my family in the summertime. We explored the Gulf Islands, we went up the Sunshine Coast, we went to marinas and cabins, we fished and we canoed. Um, I can remember boating on the Fraser River and weaving through fish boats and sometimes my dad's gear getting stuck in, in the other guys' gear. Uh, I jumped off of log booms, much to my mom's worries. It was great. It was fun. The ocean was a sense of wonder. It was a sense of inspiration and it got me into the career that I am today. And apparently I'm not alone in my feelings or connections to the coast. I mean, I think a lot of us here are from the region, from Vancouver or along the coast. And if you just go on Instagram or Twitter and search the hashtag Vancouver, you'll see images of people enjoying our coast. They're kayaking, they're recreating, they're swimming, they're on the seawall, or they're working along the coast. The point is, that we are directly or indirectly connected to our coast through a lot of um, different aspects, like the economy, like culture, food, recreation, and even family vacations. So now that we know, and now that we're all climate scientists care of John's presentation, we know about climate change, and we know about the impacts of sea level rise. So I wonder, how will our experiences living on this coast change as we anticipate and live through one meter of sea level rise by 2100? We're going to have to change over time, and we're going to have to be resilient to that change. So behind me, um, this is a graphic of the Greenest City Action Plan, and at the city, we're, we're thinking about and planning for a lot of these questions about what to do about sea level rise, amongst other things. And so this was a plan that uh, was adopted by Mayor and Council in 2011, and it supports, it's the foundation for my work and for a lot of folks at the city of Vancouver. And if you look, there's, okay, like, there's three goal areas on the left, and then there's 10 uh, planks of the plan. And so under climate and renewables, that, that one there, that's where our adaptation uh, work takes place. And that's why I'm here today to talk to you. So like other communities in the Lower Mainland, the city of Vancouver has a climate change adaptation strategy. And maybe you didn't hear about it 
doesn't always make you the popular person at the party, but we do have one. Um, and in it, uh, there's lots of um, topics about uh, water conservation, extreme temperatures, extreme heat, extreme rain, and sea level rise. And that's where we're focusing a lot of our attention these days, to the impacts of sea level rise. And we're learning with others, we're collaborating, and we're planning for it pretty actively. So, we started this work a couple years ago, and part of our first step was to collaborate with the province and our neighbors and experts like John to figure out what is going to get wet within the city of Vancouver. And so we used some of that information that John was showing, the curve, the, the, the 50 centimeters by 2050 and the one meter by 2100, and we tested different scenarios, quite a variety of them on the city. And in the end, we landed with a standard of one meter of sea level rise, high tide, and an extraordinary storm. So what you see behind me are those areas in uh, the floodplain. Those areas are vulnerable to that combination of one meter of sea level rise, uh, high tide, and an extraordinary storm. And what we did with that information in 2014 is that we set a new construction level of 4.6 meters for new buildings. So moving forward, new buildings in the city are going to be built at a level that's above the flood waters such that it includes one meter of sea level rise. And this cartoon kind of shows all the criteria that we need to think about in that 4.6. So it is high tide, it is a storm surge, there is some stuff with waves, and there's also that one meter of sea level rise. And moving forward, any coastal project that we work on will incorporate some of this, will incorporate this information. And now zooming in, this is kind of a famous, famous photo for at least around my office. Zooming in right into a neighborhood that I know I love, um, it's Kitts. So this is Kitts Pool in 2012 in a king tide. And as you know, or maybe some of you have experienced king tides, they happen a couple times a year, uh, typically in um, late December, early January, and they're the result of the moon and sun's um, gravitational forces reinforcing each other. So this is an unusual event, but it did result in the flooding of Kitt's Pool. And there's a, there's a seawall and a sidewalk right in front of the pool. Um, this was really interesting. You know, We had to respond to it as a city. And when we did our modeling, the model told us that this could be the new high tide normal in 2100. So I want you to think about that. This could be the new normal in the future. And how do we, how do we live with this? How do we adapt this, this, this cultural asset? How do we you know, change our story to include this, this type of flooding? Or how do we move the pool? Or what do we do? So at the city, we started thinking about things like this. So we know what's going to get wet, but we ask the question, what is at risk? You know, the pool is one thing, but there's a lot of other assets in our community. There's a lot of special places that we hold dear. And so part of our vulnerability assessment also included analyzing the risks um, of certain type of places, of the econ of economic hubs, and community services in 11 neighborhoods. Um, we really wanted to get down to the nitty gritty, and we really wanted to understand what made these places tick and what we needed to plan for in the future. So we know what's wet, what's going to get wet. We know what's at risk, and we know that there are new normals that we have to start planning for. So what are our options, really? Um, this was phase two of our work. We asked these questions when we looked at um, high-level approaches for all 11 neighborhoods to see what were some of the strategies that were available to us and what type of protection did they give. Generally speaking, there are four options when it comes to adaptation, and I'm very, being very general. There's adapt, so build up, and let some of the water come in strategically. There's protect, keep that water out, and then there's retreat. Let's abandon the ship and let's move away and let the water do its thing. 
The fourth, which, is an, which isn't in here, is a hybrid of all these three um, strategy options. So we worked with um, individuals and with some consultants to figure out what are the options. And there are a lot of options. Here are some examples from mostly North America. I think actually, you know, all of North America. Um, and really what you can see is that it's not a one size fits all scenario. There's lots of different variations of the different strategies. And really they're gonna reflect the location, the community's values, and, and their goals. And that being said, in each of these solutions, there are some trade-offs, but the aim of the solution is to provide protection and enhancement for that community. So the top left is a house in New Jersey, and how it's been designed is to have low-value functions on the bottom floor that could be flooded, so like parking and storage and such. All the utilities have got to be moved up. Uh, moving across the screen is the community version of this. This was drafted um, by uh, some folks at UBC for the city of Delta. And it's basically, what does the community look like if it's all raised? And you can see there's some interesting, interesting streetscapes there. Uh, famously, New York City, after uh, Hurricane Sandy, there was a great response and a great interest to do something um, about their community that would make them more resilient to future change. And so that's the Big U project. And you can see the park that kind of snakes around the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And, and what I find is, is interesting is that this is kind of, um, there's a bit of protection, there's a bit of adaptation in this, this model. The park is being expanded. There's, to, to also offer some ecosystem services. So there's wetlands and there's parts of the park that are going to get wet. They're designed to do that, but when they're dry, people can recreate um, in them. And yet, so you see the path, like a walking path is not just a walking path, but it's actually the, the top of a dike. So uh, these are some really interesting and creative solutions that will enhance the community. Finally, here's an example, a brainstorm of a hybrid design. So this is Jericho Beach Park in Vancouver, and this is a brainstorm. This is, this is not happening, I just wanna make that clear. Um, but you have Jericho on one side on the left, as it is today, and then Jericho on the right in an imaginary, imaginary world. And there's a combination of, of things going on here. Um, there's definitely some retreat. You can kind of tell that the, the front has been, the beach front has been sacrificed in some places. But there's also places that can get wet, like the ponds. The ponds have been created, and there's some uh, mingling of the ocean water and the park, so that area can get flooded, but people can still enjoy in between floods um, the region. And then there's the protection. You've got these modified groins which are sticking out, and they're anchoring um, the beach, so people can still enjoy that historical beachfront. Um, the thing is, yeah, that there are a lot of options, and it's really, we're gonna come together to, to figure out what do we value and, and what does that look like. So we, we're planning for new normals. We know we have to start that work now and, and it is taking place at the city of Vancouver. We're learning and we're collaborating with, with others to understand solutions and we're really aiming to um, to figure out solutions that will protect us now, but will remain flexible for the future. We're also uh, implementing our, our, um, an education program, which you are part of right now. It's happening as we speak, thank you. And we want people to talk about this. We want people to go home and say, you know, did you know about this? And where do you live? I live there. How am I, how am I prepared? What can we do? Um, and we're going to have that conversation over the next year or so at a very broad level, but then we're going to delve into the neighborhoods and talk with them specifically about their concerns and what they would like to see in the future because each uh, community is unique in its geographical and social setting. We really understand that and we want the plans of the future to really f reflect the people. And, um, and finally, you know, Oh, wait, or where, there you go. Oh, it's not there. Um, finally, I want to bring back um, the, the picture of the jellyfish. I want, I want us to circle back to that. Um, 
we need to be mindful of, of the impacts of our personal choices and the greenhouse gases that they emit. Um, it is a, we don't have, um, we're, on a, we're on a course, but there's still a lot of reasons to make change and to mitigate uh, greenhouse gases. As those emissions occur and the ocean changes, that will change the very social fabric of our communities. And, you know, I'm gonna go to it. This is my sister and I again, um, on the boat, the family boat. I really enjoyed my childhood on, on the boat, and I really enjoy living on the coast. And I want those opportunities for future generations to enjoy the life of the BC coast or wherever they may be. So, um, so that's my plug to really think about our personal choices when it comes to greenhouse gases and that we are in this together, we're gonna get there together, and I really think that we can do this. We can, we can reduce our greenhouse gases, but we can also adapt, we can change. So thank you. Oh, hello everybody. Um, I'd like to first begin with, I think, uh, recognizing that much of this presentation was also developed uh, when I was working with BTA Works, the Research and Development Division of Bing Tom Architects. And this would not have been possible without the foresight and generosity of Bing Tom to allow me to just explore the city as, as midst, amongst this project, amongst many others. So um, I thought I could begin with that uh, acknowledgement. So really, I think it's important to recognize in something about Vancouver that the water defines us, that it gives us our identity, and indeed it gives us our beginnings, that Vancouver was very much a city by the water, and yet within that discussion of coastlines, it changes. And and I think that it's also recognizable to realize that the coastline of Vancouver is has always been changing, that uh, it's always, um, for those who can't see, I was always fascinated by the fact of what is this, what street is this? And that is, for those who don't know or haven't seen this before, is Main Street. That um, that, that was very much Main Street, and it really kind of shows you uh, the tremendous effect that human beings can have on the environment just within the short lifespan of the city of Vancouver, as an example. And really, again, a touching upon to the very essence of who we are is that relationship to the water, that this is actually the very first uh, coat of arms of the city of Vancouver. And again, you see the importance of the port. You see the role of, of, of the water in defining who we are and how we function as a city, certainly um, in the terms of economics and, and culture, I would add. And I think it's from there we move into, I think, this diagram here. And, 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 and in the spirit of kind of straying away from my lane into John's lane, that I use this diagram as pretty much, this is the clarion call for every planner into the future. That there are a few images through which are, is the throw down of the gauntlet of future generations of folks in urban planning, architecture, urban design, and this is one of them. This reflects really the dramatic civil, civilization changing um, roles of temperature and how much that has changed over the, really over the, uh, the span of civilization uh, in, in, in certainly in North America and, and the rest of the world, of course. So really it's in realizing this challenge that we move forward in, the, in a good hunk of my work in thinking about the role of sea level rise and, and the city of Vancouver. And again, this is with some wonderful charts that John has kind of gone through, but then really what happens when we start visualizing the impact of these numbers into, in, 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 into really what's happening in Vancouver as opposed to some really abstract idea of what, uh, what, what is happening anywhere else in the world. And, and I think I really, I think at this point, um, would actually begin with, I, I think a quote, of, and, and this 
a quote I often talk about, uh, I often use in really kind of the role of talking about the future. And it, it comes from actually my favorite, uh, my favorite urban uh, novel, um, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. And it goes, are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they the shadows of the things that may be? And it's really in that spirit I move forward into this work that we did at BTA Works and hopefully I'm continuing on at SFU City Program and type in, in kind of helping frame the conversation. And really, here we are. We are here or we are there. But um, really, this kind of gives you a sense of really the topography of Vancouver and really how the land of the land that we sit in, in terms of the topography of the city. And it's from that discussion, again, we come into the idea of a changing coastline, that this is the pre-settler coastline in the city of Vancouver, that this is what was seen in those early, uh, as, as the city of Vancouver as a settler colony was being set up, and that is the original coastline. And over time, it's of course changed as per those diagrams, but I think um, it's also a little little trivia. If you ever wanted to know, what, how, what did they use to fill in that part of False Creek? Anybody want to guess? When they were blasting away the uh, Granville Cut, they had to put that somewhere. That's, that was False Creek, was where they got the material to fill in False, that, that part, that portion of False Creek. And it's coming in, and of course False Creek is the area that has seen probably the most dramatic change in terms of shoreline, that this is a scene from 1890, 1898, um, and superimposed to, well, 2009, so slightly dated, but this gives you a sense that uh, of really how change occurs in Vancouver. And I think it's in recognizing that change, it's really understanding that, well, then what's gonna happen in the future? So it's as such, uh, we did these early uh, diagrams is just to kind of anchor uh, what the conversation of sea level rise might look like. And I think it obviously the work has, I think advanced for, uh, forward, certainly I think through John and Angela's work and m many, many others. But uh, this is really just a kind of, a, just a quick visualization of really what does it mean when we talk about sea level rise and, the, and, and its relationship to the land. And this is how Vancouver looks like at zero meters, that's today pretty much, and then the kind of things that happen uh, at one meter and, and, and a good hunk of the city is actually in quite good shape I mean the rest of it's just kind of just just, um, just marshland that kind of fills in at, at, at one meters but then of course at high tide you, you see the effects of and the importance of the di diking system around Southlands at two meters and then also at three meters and really the kind of slow shift in realizing what's being affected at three meters. The interesting thing is when you factor in the, uh, the fact that it is that it's not only say that one meter but the fact that you, you have to add in an additional two meters into that count, that kind of overage, that it kind of gives you a sense of the total effect of, of a potential sea level rise, um, given whatever scenario we're talking about. So when we, ta when we talk about this is the scene of Vancouver at three meters, at four meters, and it's remarkable to kind of see that at four meters, actually Granville Island is gone. That this is of course really, I think, uh, we're entering a bit of an extreme scenario, but then it gives you a sense of really, uh, I think, um, the notion of how, how Vancouver fits into these discussions at four meters. At five meters, effectively, um, Vancouver reassumes the original, uh, the original outline of, uh, of, of pre-settler Vancouver at five meters moving into six meters that we all, we now have a new, I guess a new Vancouver Island, the Vancouver Archipelago <laughs> that, that we ta talk about six meters and of course the perhaps more, dare I say, I guess um, paleo, arch paleo, paleo, uh, pes pessimist. I was gonna say ap apocalyptic, but you know, it's all, it's all good. That, that's really what happens at seven meters when we talk, when we fit this in, in, in part of this conversation. And of course, I think this has changed through time as people have advanced this research. And really, I think it's talking about really, what are we talking about land? And we kind of see how things suddenly change in terms of land area that is affected by sea level rise at, at, these, various, uh, at uh, these various measures. And this gives you a sense of really how fast it changes, of course, once you pass a certain point of the city, and and it's not. It's of course the realization that not all land is created equal. Certainly not zoned equally in the field of urban planning, and really it also reflects that role of being that uh, that that port city 
and that land, that, that different types of land will be affected differently. Um, this is where you see something, like there isn't too much to begin with in terms of limited agriculture, but that you certainly see that our agricultural land, whatever's left in the city of Vancouver, will actually be the most heavily affected in terms of sea level rise. But then we also talk about, well, the role in the industrial lands that really, again, ref reflecting our history of being a port city, that our industrial lands are particularly sensitive. Um, and, and I think at that one meter rise, with the one meter rise, once you kick in that two meter over, um, you, you see the effects that a third of the industrial land of Vancouver becomes really, it becomes affected. And that's industrial land as of 26, uh, 2016. And I think that that really brings into really, again, a conversation of current policy. As you can imagine that the various pressures on our industrial land, particularly to residentialize, that really is that as great an idea as one might have. And I think the kind of question of trade-offs between what's an immediate issue, say something like affordable housing, and how does that fit in towards a, ch a changing environment? So that really kind of covers this discussion that not all land is created equal. And it hits into very particular public po issues of public policy, particularly in land use. I think from there we also talk about populations, and on the on the on the whole, it's actually quite a good news that um, you know immediately we don't live right next to the water, unlike certain places in the United States. But then, as you kind of see start things changing, particularly at the two meter level, that 1,400 people um, start getting deeply affected. Uh, incidentally, within the city of Vancouver. Um, I like to think there's a little bit of justice. Uh, guess who's that 1,400 people? That 1,400 people. Point Grey Road. <laughs> Sorry, Chip. That was a bad deal. So, um, <laughs> oh, this is broadcast. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it is actually unique to actually begin thinking not only about this along land, but then around people. And I think that it's as such you really begin to understand. Uh, you really begin to really, I think, understand the the fact that this is this is as much a physical science engineering question, but it's also a people question. And what do we work in terms of culture? What do we work in the si in, in, in changes in society? And I think that really, you know, when we talk about public policy, we of course think about a region. And I think that, you know, this is the scene from Vancouver at that three meter level, you know, that one meter down plus another two meters, that this is really a scene from a possibility. Again, the shadows of what could be as opposed to what will be, or perhaps it will be. But it really kind of gives you a sense of really how does things fit in beyond just the city of Vancouver, but then within the region. So you kind of go in and go like, wow, how do we create policy to engage this right now, that this is fundamentally a clarion call for action. And what kind of new, amazing policy can we create to kind of engage this forthcoming reality? And, and it's actually some good news is we already have. It's called the Agricultural Land Reserve. That by either both purpose and accident that the Agricultural Land Reserve, this vision that the pro province could maintain and feed itself, or at least maintain an element of self-sufficiency in food production, it also has become our climate change buffer in metropolitan Vancouver. And you can imagine that when we talk about changes to the Agricultural Land Reserve, we are inherently bringing in a discussion about a climate change buffer for metropolitan Vancouver, and should we we develop in these areas that we know will have that effect into the future. And I think it's talking about the future that it isn't just about the land, it's about people. And I think that the summary of a lot of our work is that is this discussion that it's not about just land that's going to become inundated, it's about people. And that by 2050, we're going to be looking at 200 million climate refugees. And this, these are just estimates out of a paper that the Canadian government had actually published about, well, actually five years ago. And you kind of imagine what was happening five years ago. Um, Canada was perhaps not the most progressive federal po government in the world in terms of dealing with climate change. But then here we went in types of discussions about about, about the software, about, about the people that could be affected around the world in terms of climate change. And of course, it's not only 200 million people that will be affected by be becoming climate migrants, it's actually the possible 500. 
and 500 to 600 million people that are at extreme risk due to climate change. And I think that it's coming down to these discussions and these conversations. You then come into really the discussion of software, the discussion of morality, of ethics, because it's within this construct, in some estimates, in 2013, we're responsible for 1.6% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So what is our relationship? What is our responsibility? What is our duty to these people? And incidentally, this was quickly reviewed by, of course, the federal government, as we all know. That's a really important element to whenever you have a federal, federal government to come into that conversation. And this is a fairly unique paper. If you really, again, look at the fact that this is the latest revision, the original paper was actually published in 2010. So this kind of, this was a forward view in terms of anticipating uh, forced migration. And this paper actually talks about how they're not, they're, we don't have an idea of climate refugees right now. That is not an actual category in Canadian immigration policy, that there are these few little exceptions. And, and this is a remarkable paper to actually read, both of its time and also into the future, that it concludes with the following that really Canada has an opportunity now to plan an orderly and effective response to a coming crisis, which again, given the time when this was published, I think gives you a certain perspective and an insight towards uh, the ongoing challenges of sea level rise and climate change. And so moving forward, really I think one of the things that we did at BTA Works was really talk about culture, really talk about the, the, the possibilities of how art and culture can change human beings, can change human behavior. And this is, of, this is actually one of my favorite examples of, the, of environmental art, that kind of how do you inform people about the realities of climate change. This incidentally came in, to, it came in from San Francisco. And we continued, continued this on with, I think, this um, discussion about the future of Vancouver. And really, we took this idea, you know, cribbed it, and kind of created this in this discussion of remaking the new Vancouver. Um, that's John, thank you so much John for joining us in creating this uh, poll. As in this discussion about the future of Vancouver, it was kind of funny because we had this poll just utterly super imposing itself to the entire <coughs> exhibition as saying that these are some of the this is one of the key factors that will help govern the future of Vancouver. And so I end with this, that this, is, that this discussion of uh, Vancouver and hope, that, um, that, that you know, when you drive around the, you know, the, eastern, you know, the, lower, the eastern Fraser Valley, you, you know, you gotta stop and take photos of signs, that uh, we are, I think, very much in this kind of paradigm, I think, um, figuratively. And I think that it's really a question of, I think, what we're willing to do, I think, in this kind of discussion of an octopus's garden to perhaps the need for a revolution. Thank you. Okay, well that was uh, that was pretty interesting, hey? I hope that was uh, I hope that makes you a little ocean wiser. I'm going to ask you, my friend, because you are wearing shorts, which tells me that you are ready for a rising <laughs> ocean. <laughs> what brought you here tonight? I'm sorry. What brought you? What brought you here tonight? Uh, the very fact that the ocean is changing, and I want to be up to date. And, and, and what, did you, what did you take away from some of what you heard? Well, you know, to take, uh, for instance, St. Paul's from the top of the hill moved in the flat plain didn't make sense to me. And I'd like to panel to comment on that and tell me why is it smart to move the hospital down in the flat plain? Yeah. All right. Okay, we got a question. <laughs> Angela. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your question. It's it's a good one. Um, so St. Paul's Hospital, the site was selected um, by a bunch of folks, but led by the province, and that was where uh, you know there was space. 
in the in the downtown um, area to serve the people who needed the service, and so it was moved there. Um, what I can tell you is that through the planning process, it will be it's go it's going to be built at a very elevated construction level, and there's going to be systems put in place to make sure it is um, operational do during all types of incidents, whether it's seismic or if it's a flood. So. Okay, let's turn this one on. Okay, there you go. So I want to ask about th this. This is a great question to kick us off because I don't know about how many of you guys were thinking this, but I was thinking to myself, real estate is so expensive in Vancouver. There is just so much pressure to use every square meter of, of land. Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of places to go when you got, you know, situations like this. So as an engineer, coastal engineer, how do, I mean, are these, dis are these discussions happening when, when we have something like a hospital, we have a very, you know, relevant human need? Are people saying, oh, how do we reconcile this with climate change? Or are they just saying, yeah, we know that we got the sea level thing, but wow, well, we got no, we got no choice. Like, is this really, is this, is, this, is, this a, is this a strong debate right now, or is it kind of this thing people think they should think about? You know, where are we at with that? Like, in, our, in the cultural change that, uh, that was mentioned. Well, I, I think um, the conversation has started, and, and, and uh, that's what I always say when people talk or ask me about the, the 2011 curve, the straight line curve, that... You know, that got everybody talking about it, and, and maybe it is just the first step on the ladder. Um, it does need to be revisited, um, for sure. And the conversations are going on. Uh, they go on at different levels. I'm not party to perhaps the discussions that you are about the St. Paul uh, issue. Uh, I think I sort of alluded to that at the very end of my presentation, where uh, when we're talking about uh, important infrastructure, then we do really have to think about you know what will be the right what's what's the right trajectory to start thinking about to start planning for uh, i think we have probably five to maybe ten more years before we'll know for certain and um, i don't know how long it's going to take to build the hospital but um we can uh, <laughs> there are still opportunities and i think i think those will become increasingly more important and i think we will have uh, even more a stronger um discussions about it and you know <laughs> I, I'm an engineer so I should probably say I'm not worried we have the technology but you know that's just a little bit too glib because we certainly will always have uh, an abundance I think of intelligence and and clear thinking and creative thinking people what we won't have is an abundance of financial resources and so I, th I think the real challenge for us in those questions is sitting down and thinking about where and when do we want to start channeling those financial resources in the most effective way. And we're only just starting to think about that. That conversation hasn't really started yet. Has the city done any kind of economic modeling of the costs of, of having to, to adapt to, to climate change and in, in some, what some of the projections are? Uh, yeah, so in, in phase two of our, of our coastal flood risk assessment, we looked at the 11 neighborhoods and we looked, um, we did some high level costing on a variety of strategies for them. So things like, like diking, infrastructure, raising, um, raising um, the, the flood construction level and, and putting in other interventions. And, and they were, and the province has also done some costing. And they were, I mean, it's, it's a tall order. Like, it's, it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and so, but that being said, not everything is going to, is, not everything is vulnerable right now. So we have time to look at our options and also weigh them out in terms of costs and, also, and, and impacts to lifestyle and, and the economy so that we can make an informed decision about where we want to put our investments. Because like John's saying, yes, we have te technology, but that, can come, that comes at a cost. And it's not just a financial cost, but it's also a livability cost. Is it, what's, where's the insurance industry at with this whole thing, Yadi? Well, I mean, it's it's interesting talking about St. Paul's and where the industry. I mean, I I I, I did two tours of post Katrina 
New Orleans, and I did one tour of of Pulse, of Pulse Sandy, New York. And it's 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 funny. It, it's there's this abstract discussion of this, and then being on the ground. And there is nothing like being on the ground to witness the idea of human hubris. That the idea that yes, we can create systems that will deal with climate change or earthquakes in for New St. Paul's fundamentally misses the point that New Orleans was not flooding for about the first two days after Katrina because the pumps were working. Mm -hmm. The problem was when the pumps stopped working that the city flooded. And I think that part of this is really the issue of not necessarily saving the humans, it's how do you hack them? That there is this... What do you mean by that? What do you mean? There is this fundamental human inability to deal with the long emergency. They're very good at dealing with the immediate emergency, but in the idea of the long emergency, that is a big struggle that we as a species don't really seem to be doing very well, and yet in this discussion of climate change and, and, say, and St. Paul's as an example, I think fundamentally it goes into is this as great an idea as it should be versus all the other political and economic reasons why this is happening. And I think that that really is part of that question of a cultural change that we're going to have to really uh, bring in to really factor in the true costs of the kind of behaviors and the idea that we have to start committing ourselves to a long-term plan that makes things actually quite difficult to happen. So in, in Holland, uh, when I was living in Holland, they, you know, it's a country that basically it's kind of built itself out of the sea. Right? Right, right. Uh, and they, they adopted a policy in 2000 of working with nature yep. rather than just, you know, engineering. Yep. And, and there's one interesting case where, it, you know, they, they basically decided the river had to do what the river wanted to do. Yep. Yep. And they needed to start, and they actually, so there's, you know, discussions in the city, they actually had to move a whole bunch of people right. from one part. So could that, and the people said, yeah, okay, we get it. <laughs> Like, you know, imagine having that discussion here. It's like, oh, you know what, this whole section, this whole neighborhood, right. you know, big part of town has to, everyone's just got to get up and move. Right. Could that actually happen ever in, in North America or Vancouver? I mean, are, how, how does the kind of, you know, North American mentality of like, this is my land and, you know, it, uh, and what what do you think? What, where are we at culturally with this whole thing? Are we are we just like totally, uh, you know, putting ourselves and our own short term needs first, or are we starting to are people starting to go? We we ha nature has to be something that we accommodate. I, I think there are examples where that thinking has come to the top. Um, uh, I believe there are areas in New Jersey and New York where the community, the, the, the municipal governments, I suppose, have stepped in and bought places out and, and people have moved and I, I, I'm not sure I'd ever want to be, face that myself, but uh, I think that's true. I think we will have to face that. I think there is a, uh, a situation, a scenario where that does happen in a fairly orderly civic society. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to see what's happening in other parts of the world and, and we'll see a lot more as, as that very interesting paper you brought up suggests. Do you think that do you think that the that there's as much threat in Vancouver not threat's not the right word, there's as much um, impact of of sea level rise from Vancouver taking on more climate immigrants, you know, as part of our responsibility and more people around the world. I mean I, I saw this in Europe that there's just the human migration that's happening there because of climate or political factors in the Middle East or Africa, people coming in into Europe, you know, the same thing could easily happen here. That may be, to me, more of an impact than the actual sea level rise in Vancouver. Because, you know, from what you're showing me, you're showing me, yeah, 14,000 people, 20,000 people impacted. Those are pretty small numbers compared to 200 million, 400 million people who are going to, they're going to need to go somewhere in the world. Andy. It's, it's interesting because I, I guess for a lot of, uh, in, in kind of writing this original paper was to kind of think that our problem's not going to be water, it's going to be people. 
that I, it, it kind of dawned on me once I gave this public lecture, um, and 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 it was this discussion. I mean, we, we had the same discussion about climate change, and and part of it was the fact that um, there was a fellow who was in the audience saying, "Well, um, you know, it's like, hi, why are you here?" And 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 he was saying, "Well, I'm an American, so I guess." already a refugee, um, but that uh, he was an American from the Midwest who was in Vancouver in the summer because the summers in the Midwest were too hot. Mm -hmm. And you suddenly realize, you know, that kind of begins moving you towards being a climate migrant. Now, the fact that you have choices and you're able to afford a place to be a climate migrant is certainly happens both at the high end that um, in, in certainly some of my discussions about the hedge city that there are parts of this world that is getting particularly difficult to breathe and hence if you have the opportunity to leave that wouldn't you to one of the cleanest breathing environments on the planet and I think that that brings into I think some really big questions because our problem isn't going to be water, it uh, isn't going to be I say, water inundation of, of our land, it's going to be the question of people. And, and, the, and in Vancouver, most of those people who are coming, yeah. uh, isn't most of the population growth happening in the lower, you know, happening right. out, Richmond, Surrey, oh, you know, right. in, in the lower areas that are probably the most vulnerable to, to climate change? I mean, I don't know that, I'm uh, asking. It, it's where it's, it's it's where the growth is. The growth is in the is it, it's it's in the it's in the southeast. Yeah, it's in Surrey and Langley, uh, in Pitt Meadows and Ridge Meadows and out there. Um, Richmond is 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 growing, but not as the fast pace as Surrey. And Surrey has like some vulnerability, uh, definitely in the Serpentine and Nickel area. And they're looking at that. They have a great coastal. They have a great adaptation strategy, and they're doing some great work out there. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting place south of the Fraser, for sure. I, I, I mean, just one last thing about the, uh, the, the issue of climate change. Is that in one way, we already, have, we already see the migrants. Um, you know, the, you, look, you look at a place like Afghanistan, that weather has changed, and it was a really, you know, very unique book talking about the changing climate of Afghanistan, how that's kind of generated what you see in its uh, geopolitical realms, because that weather changed from a weather that really supported the growth of wheat to the only thing you can grow are poppies. So you can already kind of see the destabilizing elements of climate change right now. It's not as if it's 50 or 25 or 50 or 100 years in the future. It's actually happening now. And I think the big question is actually how we have those social, economic, and political systems ready for that type of adaptation as opposed to just the stuff. What's the, what's the, the ALR was kind of a, you know, a uh, prescient, uh, policy that was put in place that is proving to, to provide a buffer. What's the equivalent now that we could do that would be prescient for 20 or 30 years down the road? What's, is there a big policy move that we could take on that would really help, you know, in the future? Don't erode the ALR. Well, okay, you're maintaining, but I'm asking you for something yes. new. Yes. <laughs> something new is typically also something old. I, I, I'm part of the whole vintage thing, you know, it's kind of cool. You know, that, <laughs> that sometimes you don't need the new, you, you can actually look at the old. And that there are certain values of certain, I think in one way, accidental happenings to a, something like the ALR, that there's all this modern temptation to, 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 to erode, whether it's industrial land, or to be honest, really one of the biggest challenges is, uh, you know, look at something like Tawasin Mills, that really, was that really a great idea if we truly believe that sea level rise is coming, and, and, and to do these types of moves, and, and yet how do we maintain that kind of courage and discipline in these, in, these, in, these, in these practices that we know are for the better good into the future, and I think that's a really big question that yeah, courage, courage. That's that's awesome. Sorry, just one one plug because it is World Oceans Day, and you did ask what is a policy. Something the old that is that needs to be new and reinforced is um, the maintenance and and restoration of our wildlife management areas along um, the Fraser River. So Sturgeon Bank, Roberts Bank, Boundary Bay. Those areas are are wetlands beyond your imagination. They're the remnant, 25% um, even less of the marine wetlands that used to 
cover this coast and that support fish and wildlife. They also serve to buffer storms and erosion that come to our coast. And with um, with various coastal projects and and you know changes in and around the river, they are susceptible. And also a lot of our a lot of. Uh, other agencies are not getting the funding that they used to. So to protect our, our coast, uh, another thing is to also um, really ensure that the integrity of the wildlife management areas um, keep going. Hold on a second. Let me ask this guy. Hi. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what for tonight? Oh, it's um, just an interesting topic and, you know, it's, hi Andy. Hey. Um, oh, is, he a, is he a plant in the? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. he, he, he's one of the many architects that tolerated me at Bing Tom Architects. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're an architect. Well, want to be architect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a, it's, it's interesting, and it's um, just another uh, idea that we have being uh, young. We have to deal with, you know. Like right now, I'm just overwhelmed with the hot marketing price and trying to get in there. But uh, to have to deal with this as well, it's just overwhelming. So I really don't have much to say, except I feel like a clam in a boiling pot right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. How about you? What, you? what brought you here tonight? Well, I'll take that. She'll take it. <laughs> no, wait a minute. I want to hear from your daughter, and then I'll, and then I'll ask you. I guess the same kind of thing. I just kind of wanted to know about the topic and just learn a little bit because I'm very unaware, I guess, in, in the general idea of it all. And what, what was your impression of what you saw? Kind of a little bit of what I already knew and then just building on the idea of you need to focus on the long term instead of just what we have right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm interested in understanding how human, as we as the people need to um, make our own personal choices about um, the CA, the greenhouse gases that we're emitting, but what are we doing um, as far as, in, as a city and government is encouraging um, solar and wind and tidal and other ways so that we can mitigate CO2 going up into the atmosphere and creating a worse so that we can keep it under a two degree Celsius, which is, I think, the cap that they're looking for to in the next hundred years. Because if we go higher into the four degree Celsius, things are going to get even worse than what you're projecting, perhaps. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. No. Thank you. That's a great question. And. Um, we have a strategy called the Renewable City Strategy, and it's a plan to get uh, to 100% renewable energy by 2050. And um, as part of that, just recently, um, uh, Council endorsed a, a policy where new buildings, new residential and commercial buildings, need to be 100% renewable or be more efficient. So we're looking to construct healthier, more efficient buildings um, that use uh, uh, standards like Passive House and, and other standards that just reduce the need for fossil fuels. Um, because, like you're pointing out, we need to reduce greenhouse gases. And one of the biggest uh, greenhouse gas emitters, um, along with transportation, are our buildings, how we heat and cool them. So we're looking to make a big change um, in emissions through our buildings. I, f I feel like one of the big challenges is actually isn't the city of Vancouver. The city of Vancouver is like one of the poster childs of doing this. It's, a, it's an incredible leader, but it's only 25% of our regional population. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have 75% of the population living outside the city of Vancouver, I feel like one of the big challenges is how do we pass on that kind of culture that is, that, that, that's nicely emerging in the city of Vancouver and have it kind of spread out into go, to, to go viral, if you will, to go into the region. Because I think that that's really going to be one of the challenges ahead. Is it's not only going to be about Vancouver, but it's about metropolitan Vancouver, much less British Columbia, and the need to really observe, really, how do we create the greater us, as opposed to just having this, you know, this wonderful island of well, islands perhaps of 625,000 people in in the province. And is that discussion happening? Like, is this is this a when city planners across North America get together? Is one of the topics on the agenda sea level rise? I mean, obviously the coast. 
cities, but is this is this something that is kind of, as I say, is it is it top of mind? Is it bottom of mind? Where does it fit in the priorities people are talking about? You're a planner, okay. So. Uh, with um, with respect to, to greenhouse gases, uh, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of cities that are talking and doing things about it. There's actually over a hundred cities, small, medium, and large in Canada, which participate in a program called Partners for Climate Protection, and it's a five-step program to reduce your greenhouse gases. There's also um, uh, the topic of sea level rise is something that we've been meeting as. A, as cities in Canada formally, um, I think since t 2008, uh, through ICLE again. ICLE is an organization based out of Toronto that uh, aims to help cities uh, reduce their greenhouse gases, but also adapt. And we're actually meeting um, in Victoria in September to talk about reducing greenhouse gases, but also adaptation. In North America, uh, the city of Vancouver is part of a, of a network of communities of like New York, San Francisco, Seattle, um, who are looking at this very challenge of sea level rise. Um, so yes, people are talking about it, people are acting about it, and, and within the region, within the lower mainland, we definitely talk with each other quite regularly to share strategies and ideas um, and tools. Great, okay, I got a question over here. Thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you to the panel. That Those were excellent presentations and very en enjoyable. I have two questions. One is about the uh, agricultural lands that are at risk, 70%, if I recall your slide, are at risk of flooding under one meter of sea level rise by 2060, according to the 2016 Hansen report. So my question to you, how real, how feasible is it both from an engineering perspective and from a, an economic perspective to protect those agricultural lands over the next 20 to, 20 to 40 years? And my second question is for you, Angela. Uh, given those projections, those radically revised projections, how will the city of Vancouver incorporate these projections into their climate adaptation strategy going forward. Thanks. So um, perhaps in answer to the first question, and it relates to a point that you made about the need and to preserve the wildlife management areas in Boundary Bay and, and Roberts Bank and Surgeon Bank being, being large areas like that, um, the, the great advantage of those areas and, and perhaps the agricultural lands behind them is that they give us the space to be a little bit more um, adaptative, a little bit more inventive in, in how to do that. We know, uh, it's well known that, um, for instance, beaches and salt marshes and, and natural features like that uh, provide a tremendous uh, service in, in damping down the wave energy, and that's an important part of, of the flooding events that would occur. So and we know that doing it that way is, is a lot cheaper than building dikes, and so I think that those areas are probably the easiest and the, and the least expensive for us to, to protect. It's feasible, it's, it's, it's not really difficult technology. Uh, there's interesting questions, is how do you do that? And how do you keep up with the slow rise in sea level? I mean, even if it's one meter by 2060, you know, it's still fairly slow and um, it, it allows the natural vegetation to perhaps be enhanced and, and uh, improved and, and helped along to, to provide that natural protection. So um, I think that's an easy, that's actually the easiest part probably of, of the issues in front of us. Yeah, and to touch upon that, so there is some certainty out to the 2050 mark, and, and I've worked with farmers, uh, I worked with farmers for a couple of years on, on adaptation and sea level rise, and there's actually, not many people know about this, but there's actually a provincial program that supports farmers across the province um, to deal with the impacts of climate, climate change, whether it's extreme temperature or, or rain or sea level. And so there's an understanding, especially the south of the Fraser again, about where they're vulnerable and what will happen, and that if, we do get a, if they do get an incident, it should occur during winter and with those summer, or sorry, with those winter rains, that will flush out the system so that the land becomes arable. But that can only happen a couple times before your agricultural business becomes uh, precarious and then you make decisions. So 
so there is some time and there is some strategy that's going into preserving that farmland or even adjusting it from field crops to something that's a little more hardier. Um, so with that, we know that we have some certainty about the 2050 and at the city, we are going to plan. We also know that, you know, people are, are it's hard to make decisions that are so future focused on the order of 60 or 80 years. So 2050 is kind of a natural fit for us. So when we look at opportunities to, you know, to do coastal improvements, we're going to we're going to try to get as much space as we can and make that space usable in a number of um, ways, like for parks or for some type of recreation so that we will have room to either buffer from flooding or storms or build up um, and take up the space to protect a community from storms. So that's, that's what we're doing. And we also, within our adaptation planning, we update the technical information, the scientific information that John generates every four or five years. So we, we keep up on it. We've already updated it since uh, 2011. So that's another way to see, like, hey, you know, the trend was saying this kind of stepwise motion, but when it starts up, then that, when that, that will be a sign for us to, okay, we need to start making some decisions in this realm, in this time span. So keeping up on, on the information is a, is a good start. Any questions up in this area here? Yeah. Hi. I'm wondering if there's a rate of sea level rise that would cause a tipping point and collapse in intertidal marshes along the coast. Um, that, that's a very interesting question. And, and um, there is some sense that, uh, for instance, existing marshes can, can withstand uh, some uh, thickness of sediment being placed over it, and we've been working together with uh, the West Coast Environmental Law on a concept which is basically called the living dike, where um, the sediment, you know, dredged every year out of the Fraser River. Right now, it's, it used, it was being used for land construction along the banks of the Fraser River. That's basically built out now, and there's an issue of where does that go. It makes sense to start thinking about putting that on the, uh, in the wildlife management areas at a rate that the existing marshes can, can withstand. And, and that would appear to be in the order of about uh, 10 centimeters uh, that they, if, if, every few years. And, and that fits in very, very nicely. You can um, actually provide the protection required for all of Boundary Bay. There's a report that's being released on this right now um, by, by doing that over um, about the next 25 years at a rate uh, actually only involves basically one year of the regular maintenance dredging program in the Fraser River. Of course, before we trained the river, before we turned it into an uh, you know, industrial activity area, uh, the, all that sediment went out on the coast. There were salt marshes before. Um, so there is work to still be done, but I, I think that uh, it's, it's quite feasible. Go for it, Andy. I, I, I actually um, wanted to go back to you. I guess the first question was, what about the insurance companies? That um, there was a view that insurance companies would somehow lead the way in, in not insuring properties that were perhaps exposed to um, possible um, issues around climate change, around storms, et cetera. Well, um, in my second um, gig in New Orleans, it was answered quite quickly. Um, go ahead, build, but just everybody's premium in the city of New Orleans went up 30%. So the overall assumption of leadership from the insurance industry wasn't necessarily there. And, 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 and that was, for me, really, really surprising. But that being said, a lot of this is also talking about our cultural institutions. I did not know there is something called the BC Expropriation Association. Do you know that? Do you know that? that there's, there's something called the uh, the Expropriations Association, which is a set of special uh, specialties, typically around lawyers, on how and how how does expropriation work? And one of the hot topics a couple of years back was how do we create the jurisprudence about expropriation of for for areas that are going to be threatened by sea level rise? How do you? I mean, you take away land for a freeway, piece of cake. Sorry, there's a freeway. We're going to give you fair market value. 
But how do you take, like, is it as simple to say, hey, sea level rise is coming, we're just going to take it to ex expand the dike, but I'll let this throw it out to the crowd here. Yeah, let me, let me tell a short story. I'll try to make it as short as I can ab about that, because uh, and Angela spoke about that, I think, very eloquently already, that Vancouver is defined by the sea. And uh, people love to come down to the sea. And, and, and many years ago, I was involved in a project in a, in a town north of Chicago uh, where there was a park and it was eroding. And the original idea was to put some rock at the bottom of it until a gentleman in the audience who had grown up there, um, elderly, and asked why couldn't we build a beach? And we were asked to, to consider that by, by the town. Um, long story short, we did build a beach and uh, it cost, so they, they turned it into a beautiful park. It cost uh, quite a significantly large, larger sum of money. Um, although the construction costs, the physical structure of it was less than the money spent on lawyers and so forth to permit the, the, the whole project in the first place, but that's maybe the US. Um, the town uh, was very clever. They, they actually funded it by a, um, an assessment on all the rated properties in the town. I, I forget the exact number. It was in the order of, I think, $500 a year. Um, they uh, also issued a change regulations so that you couldn't park within a mile of the beach, the park, the new park, unless you had a certificate, a, a, a seal on your car that certified that you were a resident of that particular city. Uh, we were retained to monitor the project after it opened and we were there in the fall after the summer and the manager told us that uh, they had just met with the real estate board and the real estate board had advised them that they noticed that after about a month after that park was opened, prices, land prices uh, in, in the town went up 10%, which represented, if I recall the numbers correctly, something like $500 million worth of, of, of value. So. The, the, the point is that expropriation, if the, I don't think it needs to be that, maybe a word, but, but there is tremendous value to everybody in a city by having a beach, by having park, by having accessible land. And yes, it may flood in a winter, mm -hmm. you know, when we get a high spring tide and we get a storm, um, but that will go away in a couple of days and, and in the summer it's still very, very valuable land and people will want to live near it or be able to get down to it. So I don't think it's a dark expropriation gloomy story. I think it's, it's a challenge to all of us to think, well, how are we going to go about setting up the processes for funding those sorts of resilient, adaptative uh, processes to, to allow us to continue to live at least close to it. And, uh, you know, I think San Francisco started that process. They have a proposition which was passed in the fall. I think it's $12 a year on every property and it goes into a, a, a fund which is held um, for uh, adaptative purposes by 2050, I believe. Yeah. They expect it to be worth something in the order of half a billion dollars. Um, we don't have that here in Canada yet, maybe, but uh, we're only just, I think, starting to think about it and uh, I think it's, all of this tonight and, and uh, ongoing, the, your, whole, your whole ongoing process is just the beginning of a very long mm -hmm. conversation that we all need to have and, and, and be engaged in. Um, it will benefit all of us in many ways, not just financially, but socially. Well, that's a great note to end on, but I'm going to ask if anyone's got a really burning question they want to ask that didn't. How, so, uh, how are you doing? Yeah. Hi there, thank you. So uh, just to add to the comment on the real estate, and I was thinking about this, and maybe the question will go directly to Angela. So is there a plan adaptation around the Concord Plaza, you know, the Concord Pacific? Because for what I know, it's mm -hmm. no one's land right now, right? It's, it's a city issue. So is, that, is there a plan for that? Are they thinking that they're saving that to be a green area? Uh, or is this something that yeah, in Northeast False Creek? Correct. Yeah, yeah, there is, and you can actually go to an open house and block party this Saturday. Um, go to, and I'm not just plugging our Facebook, but that is, the, go to Greenest City on Facebook, and and you'll find um, the details for that event. But definitely, and we were just actually, I was at a meeting at, at on that uh, this afternoon, looking at the design of the. Park 
and also of the Concord Pacific, the, red, the, the residential area, how will it be resilient? So again, we're you know talking about how do you build it up? Mm -hmm. How do you build it? What are the setbacks? What is the park going to look like um, in terms of, of services, but also its relation to the water? And, and so parts of it be absorbent and be sometimes floodable should and when an event occur so yeah that's definitely that's one of the underpinning of the, of the designs but yeah check it out saturday saturday block party down at northeast falls creek very good thank you all right thanks everybody yeah uh, i just want to say thank you guys for coming tonight i think that's really cool that you're interested in this topic and that you spend some of your time to get a little wiser about it and uh, obviously we have our panelists to thank as well so give them a big round of applause thanks for taking the time to put the presentations together and be willing to to stand up here and take questions so uh, before we wrap up I'm gonna ask Deb to come up again and uh, and talk a little bit more about the the series and other events that you can go to. Uh, I'll, I'll thank the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and, and Squamish Nations for their the territory, the land we're on, and, uh, and then we'll get you guys home. Great. Well, thanks also, Andrew, for your fantastic moderation tonight, and thanks to all of you for contributing so much and such great questions. And I really like the fact that Angela ended on talking about a party because it, it's a bit thankless talking about this stuff because, um, you know, it can be depressing, but I just, I think the basic message is now's the time to use our imaginations. And now's the time to get involved with your city and help build solutions because these are extraordinary adapters and we have time to plan our actions on climate change. So with that, the Sea Level Rise series is going to continue this fall with several more events that will happen between September and November. They're going to include a talk on uh, climate migrants and people likely to be displaced by Sea Level Rise. We'll have a First Nations storytelling event with an elder from the Haida and a local elder too, talking about their deep traditional knowledge that goes back thousands of years of coastal flooding stories. They've been here through ice ages ending and they've seen inundations and they're also struggling with coastal issues. And we'll be closing in November with a talk by renowned oceanographer and international sea level rise expert, John Englander. So exciting stuff coming up that will be being sent out um, as notifications by the Vancouver Aquarium and our other partners, City of Vancouver, and the SFU Water Research Center and the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. And for those of you who don't know, PICS at the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions is hosted and led out of UVic in partnership with SFU, UBC, and UNBC, and was established in 2008 by an endowment um, from uh, the, the Gordon Campbell government. And its, its mission is to establish uh, partnerships with government, private sector, researchers, and civil society, and develop options to better inform climate actions with a focus on BC and Canada. And on June 15th, PICS is holding a public forum and there's going to be a talk that evening called Canada's Climate Change Moonshot, BC Made Solutions and Clean Tech Breakthroughs from 7 to 8.30 p.m. I believe that's free and you can go and look at that on the PICS website at UVic. Um, and then just finally, uh, we had another partner here tonight, which was CBC. And uh, CBC has a po podcast launching tomorrow on climate change in British Columbia. It's called 2050 Degrees of Change and it's hosted by CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. And I'm in one of the podcasts, so that's pretty exciting for me. Um, so they consulted BC climate change experts, all kinds of uh, different people who work in And if you'd like, they're offering an opportunity to sample the podcast on your way out at the table there. And you can check out the podcast series online uh, that'll be released tomorrow. So um, thanks again. I, and I, I, there's one other thing I just wanted to mention. There's an amazing new initiative called Clean Seas, because on World Ocean, the thing we really have to think about is the plastic tsunami that is causing problems. And there's some stuff, people are really getting engaged with stuff to do about this. And the United Nations Environment Program and our Canadian Minister for Environment and uh, Climate Change, Catherine McKenna, 
just made an announcement yesterday about an, uh, an organization called Clean Seas. Just Google it. I've been there. I've committed to not buying plastic bags and doing all kinds of other things to try and stop plastic getting into the system. So with that, thank you to Andrew. Thank you to the panelists. And thank you to you. Have a great weekend. <laughs>